Hey Daniel, how's it Saturday morning? Hey Frank, I'm just reading security analysis. Why is your face so close to the book? Um, because I don't have my glasses and uh, I can't read without them. Do you want to have mine? You can have it. Yes, please. Oh, th thank you. Oh, that's much better. I can see. So we're going to be finishing up lecture one, um, which was all about the uh, about financial decisions and the goal of the firm. And then we're going to go through the tutorial one questions, which are on uh, chapter one. So starting up or starting off with where we finished from last week. Mm -hmm. So we talked a little bit about ownership versus control um, and some of the problems that, you know, this being a very big problem that companies have because essentially what you have is that you've got the shareholders, the people who own the firm, and then you've got the managers who are essentially running the firm on behalf of the people that own it. Now, the issue that arises here is, is that we have the interests of the owners, um, but then we also have the interests of the managers. And sometimes those interests aren't aligned, they conflict with one another. So what is good for the shareholders uh, might not necessarily be good or what the managers want. So we have this principal agent problem. So, so, so there are instances where managers, because they're controlling this firm, um, they might make decisions that are suboptimal. They're not in the best interest of uh, the shareholders. And we talked about that shareholders uh, in general would agree that um, maximizing the value of the firm was in, in general, in everyone's best interest. Um, now, I, I, was, I was talking to the class about this, uh, Frank, and in, in this day and age, we, we, we typically have uh, a lot of concentration on um, what's good for the environment, for example. So do you think that there's anything that we can discuss, um, you know, in terms of maximizing the value of the firm is typically agreed upon as a goal that is shared among the majority of shareholders, but do you think at all there's this kind of goal in terms of uh, environment-oriented uh, goals that might not be so aligned with uh, with maximizing wealth of the firm? Mm -hmm. If that makes sense, do you do you think that's becoming more of a more uh, prominent in in today's? I mean, put this market? way, there are a number of stakeholders for for any uh, for any business. There will be a stakeholder, which, for example, there are shareholders. What's a stakeholder? What's a stakeholder? Um, so a stakeholder, I think, is essentially anyone that um, is kind of affected by a company. Mm -hmm. So a company's op operations, essentially. So you don't have to be, you know, a shareholder. I mean, a shareholder is a stakeholder. A an employee is a stakeholder. Um, a citizen of the community um, is a stakeholder because that company might influence that uh, community, right? Mm -hmm. So if the company, you know, pollutes the waters, so out in the Swan River and it just pollutes the Swan River, well then now that affects me because if I want to go, you know, um, fishing in the Swan River or I want to go paddling or something like that in the Swan River, you know, I, I don't want to be paddling in, you know, waste or, uh, you know, toxic waste or whatever it is. It is. So I'm, I'm a stakeholder in that regard. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, so, so, so your point was, is that like stakeholders, like we, we, we think of stakeholders in general, um, mm -hmm. and the environment becoming, um, you know, a, a more topical issue. So there seems to be now this kind of added, uh, in, well, not incentive, but what, uh, people value, mm -hmm. right? So it's not just a company can maximize its wealth, mm -hmm. um, but it can't maximize its wealth at the expense of, uh, the environment because they Correct. have to think about stakeholders, right? Correct. They can't just think about their shareholders. Overcoming this uh, conflict and in interests between uh, the shareholders, the people who own the company and the people who are running the company, there are a few solutions um, that, you know, we, we can, we can uh, look into or apply to try and realign those interests and make sure that managers are acting in the best interest of uh, the people who own the firm. Mm -hmm. 
And so we have a couple of um, points here in uh, potential solutions. So financial reports, Frank, what's a, what, what are financial reports? We, we, we will do this in week two in the week two video. We'll go through that. Um, what are, what are financial reports? Well, financial report is the one that tells you the current financial health of the company. Um, well, there are three main ones. The first one is the yeah. balance sheet and income statement and a statement of cash flows. And how would you use that to uh, reduce the uh, principal agent problem? I mean, I think, I think one of the most important things to look at with these financial reports is that they, they have to follow um, specific guidelines set out by regulation, mm -hmm. right? which means that... Uh, when you account for certain, you know, assets or income or whatever it is, when you're putting information into your financial reports, it's done in a uh, standardized way, which means that I can compare my company's financial reports or one company's financial reports to, you know, a similar company's financial reports because we know that they have to account for certain, um, you know, uh, accounting items, whether it be assets liabilities, incomes in a similar way. So this kind of information is given to um, essentially the public. So we are able to see what the company has been earning, where its revenues have been coming from. Mm -hmm. uh, and we get to see what has it been uh, spending, how much money has gone into uh, making those revenues that it's making. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of its assets, we can see you know, how is the company depreciating its assets? And that's something that we'll cover in in week two, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cover that in the and and then we'll cover uh, in a lot more depth in capital budgeting. Um, well, how about using compensation plans, for example? How would that, how would you be able to use compensation plans to reduce or minimize uh, principal agent problem? So this is a, so this is a compensation plan for a. Um, for a manager, for example, right? So we can decide uh, how, as shareholders, shareholders can can kind of uh, vote to decide how their managers are compensated. Um, so, you know, they could pressure the board to, to do this. I mean, we can cut that, but anyway. So compensation plans are essentially deciding how our managers uh, of a company are compensated for their work. So typically they would receive, you know, an income. So you go to work, your employer pays you money that goes into the bank and you're happy. But if there's a conflict between the interests of our shareholders and our managers, and we want to realign those interests, well then maybe we could pay our managers with shares in the company. Mm -hmm. Right, we, we 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 could do that, and essentially what that means is that we're tying uh, the, the the manager's well-being or wealth with the performance of the company. So if the company performs better, then the manager's wealth is going to increase because we're now paying them in shares. So we might say we'll give you sixty percent cash as part of your. Uh, compensation and then give you 40% in shares. Mm -hmm. So now the shareholders interests are tied to the performance of the company. As the company performs better, the shareholders shares become more valuable. And now the managers who are also being paid in company shares uh, are becoming uh, better off as the company becomes more valuable. But let's just say, think, think about it, because as a shareholder, you may want to you may, you may want to have a long-term investment in this company, which means that you want a company to keep generating cash and more cash and more profit in the future, not in any short-term perspective. But what, if the, but what if the manager can only work in the company for say three or five years and after that they will retire? So how would you be able to align the interest of shareholders as well as the um, managers? Because managers say, you know, if I, if I just cut, cut corners and when I, I want to increase the profit margin for the next three years and by the time I retire I get a I get a big compensation package but that's not that's going to be at a cost to shareholders on long term so which means in this case you may design a compensation plan uh, like the remuneration package such that uh, part of the pay of the of the uh, manager will be say in a form of options 
or in a form of sort of like a contract that, you know, um, in three years time, if your performance of the company exceed X and Y, then you will get an extra pay. Such that they will yeah. be able to use the compensation plan to align interest of shareholders and managers. Yeah. And here's another one that's quite interesting, which is takeovers. Do you want to, should we elaborate on takeovers? Um, yeah, I mean, we covered this a little bit in the lecture when I was trying to uh, explain takeovers. Um, so if I'm the manager of a company and let's say that I'm um, a little bit self-serving, I want to, uh, I'm, I'm more interested in uh, increasing my personal wealth rather than my shareholders. What would you as a shareholder do in that scenario? So I'm the manager, I'm a bad manager and I'm running the firm poorly because I don't care about my shareholders' interests. I only care about my own. What would you do as a shareholder, Frank? We can vote in um, to get a new uh, board of directors, new chairman, such that they will find a new CEO to replace your job. Here's one way. But as an alternative way, I can just simply sell my shares. So, yeah. which means that, okay, you know, I, I don't want to stay, stick with this company. We, we have completely different... Um, sort of we have completely different goals, right? So which means that I can sell my shares, I jump to another company. And if every shareholder is doing the same thing by selling shares, guess what happens to the share price? It falls. It will fall. And it will, which, fall, to a, it will fall to a val- to, to, to a level where it's completely undervalued compared to what, is, what it actually represents. So all these jargons may sound a little bit of sort of alien to you at the moment, but we'll cover that in the rest of the semester. But let's just say if this company becomes a lot more undervalued and that can become a takeover target because after all the company is still holding this factory still holding all these assembly line still holding this customer base so which means that if it becomes a lot cheaper than what it actually is then someone else another company could simply come in and say you know i'm gonna buy a company because given your share price is now one dollar comparing to its fair value to say five dollars becomes a lot cheaper so i will buy a company and then once I buy the company, I'll get rid of the management because it seems like the management was the one that causing the problem. So that's why people think about takeovers as a potential uh, way to uh, solution for minimizing the principal agent problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, so agency problems. I mean, we've we've covered that. Um, so managers may act in their own interests rather than. Ben- rather than the best interests of the shareholders. So we have this misalignment of uh, interests between the shareholders and the people who are uh, running the firm. Um, We said one solution to this is that we can tie management's compensation to the firm, uh, the firm's performance. How could we measure performance? What's just one way we could measure performance? Because there's many ways that we could measure a company's performance. What's one way that we could measure a company's performance? Growth of revenue, growth of market share, growth of the profit margin, growth of customer base, and um, yeah, a growth of share price. Yeah, absolutely. So there are a number of ways that we could essentially tie the firm's performance. Um, we, we could essentially tie the firm's performance to a different, many different metrics. Um, and sure, some metrics are going to be more important for other firms. Um, going to the next slide, uh, the CEO's performance. So this was uh, essentially discussing what, uh, if, if the CEO is performing poorly, um, shareholders can express their dissatisfaction by just selling the shares. Of course, the shareholders could also put pressure on the board to say, change um, change the company's leadership. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then of course they could just, they've always got that um, ability to shit sell their shares. So typically the board would listen, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, you'd hope they would. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and then you could have a hostile takeover. And this is really the function of a lot of uh, private equities. Is that right? You're you're a bit of a bit of no, an expert. Not necessarily. Right? Well, it depends because typically a private equity firm would not private equity fund would not actually invest in a public companies in Australia or <laughs> in the US. Uh, but mm-hmm. I think in this case, what they're trying to say here is that if they see that, if they see there's a there is an opportunity for, for them to turn this company around, uh, because what private equity fund typically brings in is the management expertise 
right? Yeah. They turn, they, they turn this company around, dress this balance sheet and, and all the other account, all the other um, accounting statements. And then, so after two or three years, they do the IPO again and sell it as a new company. So, yeah. uh, and like a very uh, infamous example was Dick Smith. All right, so that's that's really just covering uh, the principal agent problem, and that problem just simply arises because there are owners, and those owners are separated from the people who are controlling it. So the in, the interests aren't always aligned, and it's about trying to get those interests to align. All right, so moving on to the stock market. Um, so some some students might have already traded some stocks. They did. Uh, you know, some uh, in the lecture did mention that they um, have traded some some stocks. We have a private corporation has a limited number of owners, um, and there is no organised markets market for its shares. And a public corporation can have many many owners, and its shares trade on an organised market called a share market. Um, I mean, I think the, the interesting point here is. Uh, an organized market. So if I was, because uh, I've actually had some private shares before, how would I go about selling those shares? It would be Do quite you know? difficult. It would have to be something like over the counter, like mm -hmm. someone would have to essentially make a, make the other side um, of the transaction for me. Uh, That's right. Yeah. So well, that, that, I mean, you probably, I mean, people have probably heard about all these um, unicorn companies. Uh, unicorn companies are the one that defined as the private company and they have a valuation private uh private valuation above one billion dollars i mean typical examples such as you know back then uber and snap and all these internet companies so for them you know you probably have heard about they have a second round of uh, equity raising third round of equity raising and fourth round of equity raising typically they are, they are, they are open to institutional traders or private equity private funds or um, but it's never really to a, any sort of retail shareholders in that sense partly it's because this transaction can be very complex and it's not just saying I want to buy a share from someone but yes you have to go through a whole bunch of um, valuation uh, valuation process and but your goal is essentially which means people saying the exit strategy is essentially to Float this company into a to a to an equity market, which they call initial initial public offering IPO, which is also called floating. They want to float this company to a public market such that they can then sell that to retail shareholders, which then takes to a very important function of the stock market, which is as you can see on the slide, is to provide liquidity to to public companies as well as to do a price discovery. But I just focus on the liquidity provision role here. So how do we define liquidity? Um, essentially, liquidity can be described as uh, the ease to which something can be bought or sold. So, in in the case where we're talking about a private corporation, uh, you made it sound as if it was very difficult to buy and then sell shares or ownership in a private company. Right? So, using that example, that's not very easy. So, selling buying and selling shares in a private company is something that we would say is illiquid, right? It's, it, it's quite difficult to sell that, whereas, or buy that. Whereas in a public company, essentially, I mean, a pub, yeah, with a public company on an organized exchange, you can kind of think of this exchange as like a nexus, right? And this nexus is essentially there. And when somebody says, I want to buy some BHP shares, they know where to go to to buy BHP shares, right? They go to this central point, this little nexus, and then when somebody says, I want to sell BHP shares, they know exactly where to go, right? They go to this nexus, this organized stock exchange to sell their BHP shares. Now you can think how, uh, how that makes buying and selling much more efficient and much more liquid because people who want to buy BHP and people want to sell BHP are matched on that organized stock exchange. So they kind of go to these, uh, they, they kind of, um, they, they, they all kind of go to these, uh, they, these stock exchanges to, to trade with one another. And that's essentially what allows uh, stock or shares to be a lot more liquid, right? People can mm -hmm. buy and sell them very, very easily because there's a lot of people all going to that organized stock exchange to buy and sell their stock, uh, to buy and sell their shares.
what you'll see, um, so if you will see this on the next slide, I mean, I actually took uh, this picture on the next slide. Uh, maybe it's a bit easier if we just go to it. Um, so this slide here. So this was taken from uh, Comsec and essentially what it's showing is uh, BHP. So if I wanted to buy or sell shares for BHP, I might see something uh, like this. Uh, so Frank, can you tell us uh, some important information that we're seeing on this, uh, on this slide? Well, first of all, this it is about BHP Group Limited. That's the company that you'll be buying trading at with a ticker symbol BHP. Very important. You don't want to buy BHP something else. So you, you want to buy the, the shares that you wanted to buy, right? So here it tells you the last, last price measured in Australian dollars, which is 38.65. And it tells you a bit of sort of statistics like it's gone up by about 29 basis point, which is 0.29%. And here on, the, um, maybe you can see on my mouse cursor, here it is a bid and as an offer. So from the previous slide, we def we had a quick definition of bid and offer, but let's just focus on, focus on this, what people call limit order book. So here you have all the buyers queuing up to say, they're raising their hand and say, I want to buy this company shares, but nothing has happened yet. And on the right hand side, you have sellers who want to sell these shares but nothing has happened yet. So which means we call, the, we call those are standing orders. So take the first example, 38.64. You can see that that number is slightly below the last price, last transaction price. And that tells that at the moment in the whole market, someone or maybe a, a bunch of people, they want to buy BHP at 38.64 and the total number of shares they want to buy is 2,000. Not 3,000, not 4,000, that's 2,000, which means that maximum there are people want to buy at 38.64 at 2,000. They already, uh, they're already waiting the queue, raise their hand. And in the seller side, here you can see that the price goes from low to high, and that shows the, um, that shows the order. So in this case, uh, someone willing to sell at 38.66 for about 254 shares. But that hasn't happened yet, which means someone want to sell that price. And, he, and, he, and as you can see, it's not surprisingly, this seller's price is above the buyer's price at 38.64. So which means, let's just say, here, I am a new investor. I come into this market and I, and I don't want to wait in the queue. I want to buy straight away. So to buy straight away, you know, we technically call it, that's sending a market order. Let's say I want to buy straight away. So then are you going to buy from the buyers or are you going to buy from the sellers? Well, most likely you'll be buying from the standing sellers. So which means in this case, the offer, if you go back to the previous slide, so an offer here is an offer from someone to sell, but it's the price you can buy it. Which means if you're a new investor, you're coming over here saying, I don't want to wait in the queue. I want to buy something straight away. Then you'll be buying from someone is standing there and selling at the current price, which is the, uh, an offer price. So if you go back to the next slide, so which means if you if you are impatient, you wanna buy straight away, you'll be buying at 38.66. Same thing goes if I am a seller, but I don't want to be waiting in the queue anymore, and I wanna just wanna sell straight away for whatever reason it is, you don't have time, and he's saying, you know, cause I really want to get it done. Right, so then you'll be selling to an existing buyer, and in this case, um, you'll be selling at thirty-eight point six four if you have less than two thousand shares. That's yeah. basically how we interpret this chart. So when people talk about price, it is sometimes they think about is last trader price. Sometimes it can be the bid price, which is the buy, the highest buyer price. Sometimes it can be the ask price, which is the lowest seller's price. But most likely people would be saying is the midpoint, which means is the average of this 38.64 and 38.66. And that would be the uh, midpoint of bid ask price. That is just a, a quick way to say, what is the price of BHP? But then when people think about what's the price of BHP, it doesn't mean you can actually buy at that price or sell at that price, which is kind of what's quite interesting in finance. You know, when people talk about the most basic concept, but no one actually means that's the things that you can be trading at. Yeah, I mean, I think this is this is a common 
um, area where a lot of students learning this for the first time uh, get a little bit confused when they see the limit order book. They see the buyers and the sellers um, and see they see the buy side and think, that's the price I buy and then they see the sell side and they think that's the price I sell, which is not true because you have to see that these orders that we see on the on the buyer's side and the orders that we see on the seller's side, the people on the buyer's side, they are people who want to buy the shares, mm-hmm. right? On the seller's side, they are the people who want to sell the shares, right? So if you're coming into the market and you say, I want to sell these shares, well, then I need to sell these shares to somebody who wants to buy them. And then the same side, if I want to buy these shares, I need to buy these shares from somebody who is willing to sell them to me. So it's it's it, that, that's typically the, the, the place where a lot of um, students get a little bit confused. Correct. Can I take over just to, uh, very quickly? I want to share my screen. Yeah. Uh, so on that point, and this is this discussion board that we have, and um, you may have you may have uh, log in to check the discussion board, which is linked on your left hand side left panel discussion board. So um, I think there was a question asked by someone from last year about bid or ask price. So if you're not sure about the concept we just talked about, uh, feel free to come over here to to um, to read more about what's the bid and what's the ask price over here. Um, I think I gave give them a little bit of example, give everyone yeah. uh, with little, very um, simplified Limi order books over here. So feel free yeah. to read it. Um, that should clear all, the, all your doubts. Cool. Okay, so that's um, the limit order book. And you know, if you're going to trade any shares, this is, uh, you'll see a page is similar, uh, similar to this, depending on what um, trading platform you use. This is Comsec. Um, but you know they will be fairly similar. Um, do we need to cover this in a big way, or probably not? So this this slide here is really just pointing out that there are there are a, a few exchanges that really dominate the global market in terms of um, how frequently shares are traded. So on the x-axis we have the average daily turnover in US dollars. And then on the y-axis, we have the different ex- um, a number of different exchanges around the world. I mean, granted, we don't have them all here. Um, and you can see that it's uh, a lot of the volume is coming from uh, the US and China. Hmm. Uh, Which tells you that some share markets, so even, even though we're saying uh, share markets, uh, pro- uh, you know, the function of the share markets to provide li- liquidity, but certainly some share markets are more liquid than the others. Right, and if you want to find out whether is a whether is a great way to say list in the home market, which is say for example, if you're an Australian company, I want to list in Australia, comparing to if I want to list or raise funds from US or raise funds from Singapore, that could be something quite advanced. You can think about doing a research in that area. Uh, there will be something called home bias that you know people will favor a lot more to the home market. And you can also think about, well, is that could be a cross-listing perspective, which means I listing my home market as well as the US market, that will be appealed to shareholders, investors in both markets. Or I can simply just do a cross-border list listing, which means I'm based in Australia, but I go to US to raise funds. There are all pros and cons in every single, uh, in every single strategy. And, um, but that could be something that you're looking forward to do as a research student, that could be a research topic. Or if you are joining the finance industry, that could be something that you will be you know, in the advisory team to think about what's the best way to raise, adi- uh, raise additional funds. Yeah, cool. All right, um, so moving on, the stock market, well, we covered public companies, we covered uh, private companies. The two things that we haven't covered, well, I mean, I guess we have, but not uh, specifically related to a primary market and a secondary market. Um, So a primary market, when a corporation itself issues new shares and sells them to investors, they do so on the primary market. Frank, you mentioned a specific terminology earlier. Initial public offering, floating? Yep, an initial public offering, offering or an IPO, essentially, the first time this company's shares are available to the public. So 
Um, that, that That's the primary market. The secondary market is, for example, what we would see if I just go back to this slide. This is a secondary market. These are existing shares that have that were once issued by the company and now they're just changing hands between investors um, based on whether or not they want to buy or sell the HP. Correct. So this is really a secondary market. The shares have already been issued and they're just existing shares that are just changing um, between investors. Correct. I mean, in, in fact, there, are, there is no physical, in terms of the physical location, there's no difference between a primary market and secondary market. Everything now, nowadays hap, happens electronically. But it's just a terminology that we're saying. When we're saying that's a primary market, that means that that's going to be the new shares that are going to sell to investors. In this case, it could be the initial, initial public offering. It could be the seasonal, seasonal equity offering, SEO, IPO some technology that's going to come across again later on in other units. But most likely when we say uh, share market, we, may, we refer to it as a secondary market, which means it's, it's, the way, it's the market where people buy and sell shares. And um, it's, the, it's the market where people are saying that is where you provide liquidity to exi existing shareholders and the price discovery for, the, for other shareholders to find out what is current value of the company. may not be the accurate value, but it, but it's the value that agreed by the market participants. Yeah. Uh, the, so that this is just essentially summarizing week one. So the focus, well, or what we will be looking at um, throughout the semester, we're going to be looking at you know how managers make decisions that are going to maximize the wealth of uh, the firm, and you know therefore the benefit to the benefit of the shareholders. Um, so we need to be able to look at or value financial assets, value real assets, um, and be able to uh, measure risk-adjusted required rates of return. I mean, there's a lot of new terminology in that that I don't think uh, the students need to worry about after week one, mm -hmm. uh, because certainly we're going to cover the, 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 what risk is, what a uh, rate of return is um, in, in later weeks. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, we, we don't need to stress on that third point as of yet. Mm -hmm. um, so focus on financial decision making by managers of listed corporations. Uh, so to make optimal decisions, we need information. And how yeah. do we interpret this information? How do we um, understand how much cash does this company have? Are they have they been a profitable business? How are they comparing to their peers? Then we actually need to review, which is just, you know, how do we actually be able to interpret accounting reports, understand what they are, which is the accounting reports here plays an emphasis on measures and approaches to investors used to assess performance and value. And um, so I will be recording the next uh, lecture and it will be made available online as well. And so now, let's move on to talk about the week one tutorial. All right, now let's talk about tutorial questions. This is the first question, chapter one, problem one. What is the most important difference between a corporation and all other organization forms? Well, apart from the taking different names, uh, there are a number of differences, key differences. Well, first of all, a corporation is a legal entity separate from its owners, um, which means shares, which is the ownership, represent the ownership in the company, can be freely traded. Anyone can be the, can, can be the owner of the, uh, of the company. And well, no other organization forms actually share this characteristic with Ponding did. And investors can be anonymous from any background and there is no limit as to how many owners a corporation can have. And um, so if you think about sole trader, how many owners can you have in the sole trader? One. You know, minimum one and maximum one. Yeah, for partnership, that would be minimum two. And um, can you think about any other differences that uh, that come, come across your mind? Yeah, well, I mean, a another big point is, is that because it's a separate legal entity, it means that it enters into contracts. Mm -hmm. itself so when so when a company um enters into this contract it's not the individual like an individual in a sole trader or or a partner in a partnership entering into a contract it's actually the company itself entering into a, uh, 
into the contract, which is where we started to distinguish between this limited liability and unlimited liability. Uh, because it's this, this company that's entering into these contracts means that, you know, if something goes wrong, uh, then any, anyone that we owe money to uh, can't essentially come, come to us uh, and try and seize our assets to repay uh, what's owed. Correct. Uh, and, um, but so... to, your, to your point of uh, the anonymity and essentially anyone can be a shareholder, do you think that makes raising capital? So when the company needs to invest in a new project or it's trying to expand, grow, or whatever it is, and it sells shares, do you think that makes it a lot easier for companies to raise capital? Because essentially anyone can own it without, you know, it doesn't matter what their educational background is, it doesn't matter where, where they're living or anything like that. It's just anybody who's willing to uh, give this company money can. Of course. Right? Of course, yeah. but when but when it comes to a block holding, for example, when you when you are holding the shares exceed certain amount of a company that start taking control of the company, then uh, then the government agency may actually step in, or the regulators may come and step in to say whether that would violate any security conditions. For example, you know, let's say if you if if you're a Chinese company that you want to take over another U.S. company that working telecommunication service, then that may violate some sort of certain, certain security conditions in US. So that kind of takeover may not be approved by that, by the uh, regulators. So, so in that case, investors, so not everyone can be, can be the invest, can be the, uh, the, not everyone can be the block investors in this case. So, um, yeah. so, but this definition applies in a general sense. Yeah, cool. Um, let me just quickly share, um, you my um, so here is something something very interesting. This is again our discussion forum, forum one. Questions related to lecture materials. Um, so there's a, there are a number of threads that I think is quite relevant to um, to students this year, which were asked by uh, students from last year. The first one is company versus firm. So I, I think a student asked from last year saying, what is the difference in the term company and firm? Because we trying to, I mean Daniel or I tend to use them interchangeably. And here, if you want to read about it, uh, I'm more than encouraged to read about company and firm. Oh, and in fact, um, a corporation is not legally defined in Australia. Uh, when we talk about business forms, there are only company, not corporations. Um, here's another one. And if you want to learn more about limited partners versus board of directors and shareholders, here's actually a very interesting thread. thread. And uh, feel, free to, feel free to read it. Um, yeah, and um, if you have more questions related to it, definitely feel free to ask that. Okay, now let's look at tutorial question number two, which is chapter one, problem six. You are a shareholder in an Australian corporation. The corporation earns $2 per share before taxes. Once he has paid taxes, it will distribute the rest of his earnings to you as a dividend. The corporate tax rate is 30% and you are on the lowest tax rate of 19%. How much is left for you after all tax are paid, refunded? All right. So now let's go to the Daniel side. What's the first thing we need to do? Um, well, we need to see how much the company has made. So how much has the company made in its earnings and how much is it going to be taxed on those earnings? So it's made $2 per share, um, which is just an earnings figure. That's all. So what we have to work out is uh, how much does the company essentially distribute to its shareholders? So the company is going to pay 30% tax and then it's going to distribute that entire dividend or that whatever's left over to its shareholders. So we have the $2 per share. And now what we want to do is, is that we want to work out how much is left over. So what we have is that we have uh, one minus the company's tax rate of 30%, right? So all this is saying is, is that what the company is going to pay out to its shareholders is essentially 70% of this $2 earnings per share. And that will give you $1.40. So what we can see here is, is that the company has essentially paid 60 cents in tax. So the difference between the 
um, before tax and the $1.40 after tax is the 60 cents that the company has paid in company tax. So that's gone to the tax office. So in the, in, in, in the question we're told that we're only supposed to be paying 19% tax. So as the investor, I have a marginal tax rate of 19%. So we need to work out how much, how much tax I'm supposed to pay and how much I'm going to be left over at the end um, after, paying all ba uh, after paying back this tax. Correct. So how do we go about doing that, Frank? What's the first step we should, we should do? Well, we should work out how much dividend we're actually receiving and what is the total taxable income that we, we, um, we have to pay. So the dividend that we received was $1.40. And then we learned about this imputation credit. Mm -hmm. What was the imputation credit? Which is the 60 cents. Yep. So that's what essentially the company has paid in tax. So that was and now we're going to calculate how much we're going to pay on tax based on the grossed up amount. So we add our dividend that we've been paid by the company and our imputation tax credit or our franking credit and that will give us the two dollars. So we're going to calculate the amount of tax that we're supposed to pay based on this $2. So the amount of tax we're going to pay is our $2, which is our grossed up amount, multiplied by our tax rate of 19%. And that's going to say, well, we should be paying 38 cents in tax per share. That's what we should be paying. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. So that's what we should be paying. How much has the company actually paid? 60 cents. We paid 60 cents. So, well, it seems like as a shareholder, I've paid too much tax. Mm -hmm. So we can use this imputation tax credit here of 60 cents to offset the tax that we're supposed to pay the tax office of 38 cents. Mm -hmm. So what do we do to work that out? So what we're gonna do now is, is that we're gonna determine how much the individual should pay in tax. So we're going to deduct the franking credit of 60 cents. Oh, sorry, we're gonna, oh yeah, the franking credit of 60 cents from the tax that we should have paid of 38 cents. Mm -hmm. So, so the tax paid will be <clears throat> our tax that we owe the tax office minus our franking credit. Can Correct. You see that okay? That's right. 0 0.38 yep. minus 0 0.60. Cool. So that means that we actually have a negative number. What does that negative number mean, Frank? Well, that means it will be a money coming back to you. So if you yeah. pay a negative price, that means it will be a money, will be, will be an income, will be an inflow back to your pocket. So remember that we're, we're actually calculating the tax paid here. So essentially that negative number, yeah, we've paid too much tax. So the tax office is going to give us 22 cents per share as a refund. Cool. We happy with that? Yep. Um, so <clears throat> how much tax has uh, essentially been paid in this scenario? Well, what we're left with at the end of the day, what we're left with in our bank account, after we've gone through all of this, what we're left in our bank account is this $1.40 that the company gave us in the dividend and the tax refund that the tax office gave us. That's what we're left with. So in our bank account, we have, uh, so how do, how do I write this to determine the amount of tax to be paid? No, where is it? Oh, the amount left. Okay. So the amount of 
the dividend left is equal to our $1.60 that the company gave us plus the refund from the tax office. Oh no, sorry, we didn't, it wasn't $1.60. All right, it's right. one, 140. 40. Yeah. So the dollar forty in dividend from the from the company, the twenty two cents from the tax office. So we are left with one dollar sixty two in the bank. Correct. So at the end of the day, what? How much tax have we actually paid? Well, we've actually paid the difference between. The initial two dollars can you still see this too yes so the initial two dollars that we received minus what we end up with in our bank account that's right so tax paid is equal to the two dollars minus the dollar 62 which is equal to 38 cents that's right. Right. So now having a look at that, we can, I'm running out of room here. We can essentially uh, say that our effective tax rate in this circumstance was 19%, which is your personal tax rate. Yeah. So which right. means, so which means mathematically you will say, uh, after all this calculation, your uh, the the in, the tax rate that you'll be receiving is, is essentially your personal tax rate, but the whole process actually goes from this way: that you get paid dividend one dollars forty, and you get paid a credit with sixty cents. That is a tax credit, and then in this case, your total taxable income will be the two dollars, which means which which means is one dollar forty plus the sixty cent credit, and then from that you work out what is the tax paid which is $2 times 19%. And then, but because you, because the company already pays 60 cents tax for you, so which means you owe them 38 cents, but the company pays 68 cents for you, so which means essentially you're paying minus 0 0.22, which means if you're paying a minus uh, amount, that becomes, you will get paid. So that means in real life, that will be offsetting your other part of the income tax that you are receiving from your work or from your other sources of income. So in this case, essentially, you will get paid $1.62 after all the transaction. Uh, that, may have, that may happen at a different time point, and, um, but it's important for you to, to know that the effective tax rate is determined by a personal tax rate. Yep, excellent. Okay, let's move on to question three. Um, again, I'm gonna share my screen to look at. So qu question three, is pretty much the same thing. Right, repeat the previous question with the highest personal tax rate of 45%. So here we're gonna give you another demonstration about how to consider when your personal tax rate is actually more than a company tax rate. So which means you end up paying more taxes um, than what a company can actually pay you back as a credit. All right, so everything back to where we start that companies give you $2 per share and then company's tax rate is 30%. But the difference here is that your personal tax rate is 45%. Yeah. So you can see that this question starts off in exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. There's no difference here. But when we come to calculate uh, the amount of tax we should pay, well, our tax rate now is 45%. So the tax that essentially we should pay on the $2 earning per share is, or I, should, I shouldn't say $2 earning per share, I should say the grossed up amount between the dividend and the imputation credit is one, oh no, one line, sorry. Right? Mm -hmm. Which is 90 cents. So this is essentially saying because we have a tax rate of 45%, we should be paying the tax office 90 cents per share in tax. Now you should notice straight away that, well, the company paid 30% in tax, which means the tax office really only received 60 cents per share, but you should be um, taxed at 45%, which means that you should be paying 
90 cents per share. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to work out, well, how much tax should we actually be, be, be paying? Well, we can use our, uh, our imputation tax credit and deduct that from the amount of tax that we ought to be paying. So what we end up getting here is, um, so the amount of tax, so I should say net amount, but amount of tax, it's really a net amount. Um, so that is the, uh, the amount that we are charged minus our imputation credit. So what does this 30 cents tell us, Frank? That means you still owe tax office 30 cents. So here, yeah. given that is a policy amount, that means that's how much you owe them. In, in a previous example, question two, that number was negative. So that means if you owe tax office negative amount, that means tax office need to refund you that amount. Yeah. So essentially we need to give the tax office uh, some more money because our personal tax rate of 45% is greater than that company's tax rate of 30%. So now we can go ahead and calculate. So essentially we owe the tax office 30 cents. We received a dollar 40 in our bank account from the dividend. Mm -hmm. So now we can work out what's left at the end of it. So what's essentially left in our bank account. So uh, how should I write this? We are left with $1.40, right? So that's the $1.40 that the company gave us minus the 30 cents, minus the 30 cents mm -hmm. that we owe the tax office. Yeah. So what we're left with is $1.10. So how much tax has been paid? Again, it's the difference between what we're left with and what the original $2 uh, or what the original earnings was. Um, so the difference, so the amount, I should just say tax paid. The amount of tax paid is equal to our $2 per share minus our $1.10 that we had left over. So we've paid 90 cents in tax mm -hmm. and so our effective tax rate should be the same so we just have our 90 cents that we paid in tax divided by the total two dollars and that will give you 45 percent which is not your, surprisingly your personal income tax rate yeah excellent so um so as an extension um you may want to think about if that was a us c corp C corporation, when there is a double tax system, what what is the final amount you'll be receiving? So that can be extension that you can do in your own time. And if you have questions, please feel free to put it on the discussion forum. Excellent. All right. So now let's come to tutorial question number four, chapter one, problem nine. So why do all shareholders agree on the same goal for the financial manager? So we talked about this when we uh, really covered um, the principal agent problem and trying to align the incentives of people who uh, own the company, the shareholders, and the people who run the company, the managers, and we're trying to align those incentives. And so we, we really need uh, people to um, come up with some common goal, something that they were all trying to achieve. Um, and well, I think it would be, the majority of shareholders would agree that maximizing their wealth will make them better off, right? So that becomes a very common goal. That is the common goal for shareholders. And essentially they will, um, you know, encourage or I shouldn't say enforce, but, but they, 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 they certainly want their financial, their, their managers of the company to maximize the wealth of, um, of the company. But just, just, 
but just like all other great things, that maximizing shareholder wealth is not clearly defined, or at, at least it's not universally defined, uh, not universally agreed on. So, yeah. I mean, we um, in the previous uh, finishing of the lecture one uh, video, we talked about something re related to uh, like other types of measures to measure the um, shareholder wealth in terms of like um, medium term to long term. So, for example, if you think about from an environmental point of view, that is, um, that, that is, if the company's goal is to exploit the environment that they, they, they are operating in, and by not taking care of the sustainable uh, sustainable use of the land of the or, or the or the material that they have, then that may not be an actual goal of maximizing shareholder wealth because you may be looking into forty years, sixty years. So, um, so it's actually maximizing shareholder wealth is not again it's not clearly defined. Yeah, but we but we typically just use it because it would be common amongst most shareholders of course there are people with different opinions and so on and so forth but when we look at the majority of the ownership of a company typically it's agreed upon that maximizing wealth is uh essentially the common goal because it but, makes them better but let me just uh, just quickly ask you a question would maximizing yeah. profit uh, and like equivalent to maximizing shareholder wealth uh i wouldn't say that they're equivalent um, because I mean, what, what do you, what do you mean in terms of maximizing profit? Do you mean maximizing profit now, or do you mean foregoing profit now for profit in the future? That's right. So the, the way, the reason why I ask that question is because people tend to think about the more profit I have, the more money I have, is that an equivalent way of saying that will be maximizing shareholder wealth? Or clearly in this case, you're not because sometimes you in a scenario where you foregoing the long-term benefit in exchange for the short-term short profit, would that be maximizing shareholder wealth? Probably not. You would say, well, they, they will maximize some shareholder wealth if they only want to hold short-term. But for the majority of shareholders, you would tend to say, maybe on average, people want to tend to hold long-term. So on average, I want to maximizing longer term profit rather than short term profit. So again, that question is just trying to illustrate that it is not universally defined what you mean by maximizing, maximizing shareholder wealth, but it's cl clearly not maximizing the, uh, the manager's wealth and not maximizing a single shareholder wealth. Yeah. And that will be completely violate the goal of the company. Yeah, excellent. So now on. let's come to question. Um, all right, now let's come to tutorial question number five, ch chapter one, problem 13. You are the CEO of a company and you're considering entering to an agreement to have your company buying another company, like taking over. You think the price might be too high, but you, but you will be the CEO of a combined much larger company. You know that when a company gets a lot bigger, you pay and uh, prestige will increase. What is the nature of the agency conflict here and how is it related to ethical considerations? Well, so we're told a few things here. So one, we're told that this company wants to buy another company. And upon buying this company, you know, it's going to become a larger company, one larger company, we've got two and it becomes one larger company. Now, what it's saying is, is that you as the CEO, you might think if I buy this company now, I might be paying too much for it. And so obviously that's not a good thing if you're paying too much for something, because essentially what we'll learn in later weeks is that when you're paying too much for something, well, then that's going to be reducing the value uh, to your shareholders. Mm -hmm. uh, so you might essentially pay $100 for something and then that something might only ever return you $90, right? So you're worse off by $10. And mm -hmm. so you wouldn't even make that decision. You'd rather just hold on to the $100 and wait for something that will return you $110, right? Because then you have plus $10. Mm -hmm. So in this instance, we, we look at this and we say, well, this company might be priced too high. And if it's priced too high, then we would think that that's going to destroy value for our shareholders because it's going to be destroying value for the firm. But here's the conflict, right? Is that the CEO looks at this and says, well, the amount of money that I get paid, so you're the CEO, the amount of money that you get paid is dependent on the size of the company. So 
what are, what, what, are, what are a few ways that we could measure size, Frank? Uh, size combined of- revenue, combined uh, employees, and uh, your number of, co- yeah, exactly, the asset, total asset. Yeah, so like there, there are a number of different things that we could look at in terms of the size of this company. Um, and so as, that, as those metrics grow larger because we've acquired another company, the CEO's compensation increases. So now you can start to see the conflict that exists between the people who own the company, the shareholders, they want to maximize their wealth, right? They want the company to be increasing in value and the share and the CEO who's sitting there thinking, well, if I acquire this company, it's going to destroy the value for shareholders, but I'm going to get paid more. So there's a conflict here. So there's a bit of an ethical dilemma um, when the CEO of a firm has the opposite incentives here. So I could right. get paid at the cost of destroying value of the shareholders. Correct. And here's and this question actually uh, highlight, highlights the, um, the example that we just made in discussing question four, which is the, the goal of the company is to maximize shareholders' wealth but not a certain proportion of shareholder wealth. Because in this case, you could somewhat, some may, may come and say, well, the CEO is buying another company, paying a much higher price than he should, but isn't that gonna be benefiting the other, the other, section, the other sex, segment of the shareholders? Which means when a company, in a combined company, the original target, which is the other co- another company over here, their shareholders are going to be better off. Isn't that, isn't that still doing the job? Because someone's going to be happier. So remember, we're maximizing shareholders' wealth, but not a certain proportion. We want to maximize every single shareholders in this scenario. Yeah. Uh, all right, now let's come to the last question. Here is a table. It's supposed to be tutorial question number six, chapter one, problem 18. Um, so this is the question related to, to uh, the share market. So the following quote on AMP limited shares appeared on 5th of January 2016 on Comsec, which is about four years ago now. If you wanted to buy AMP limited, what price would you pay? How much would you receive if you wanted to sell AMP limited? So this question sort of really examine on your ability to looking at the limit order books, which is what we talk about here. If you look at a standing buyers and standing sellers. So in this case, if you want to buy AMP, if you want to buy AMP, are you going to the seller side or are you going to buy a side? If you want to buy it straight away. I'm going to go to the somebody who wants to sell me the shares. Exactly. So in this I'm case, that's right. So in, so in this case, if you want to, if you actually want to, um, to buy from someone, then that means you, you go over there and say, who is raising hand to say they want to sell? Well, in this case, there are a whole bunch of people who want to sell. There'll be people who want to sell at 521, 522, 523, and that's the, the corresponding amount of shares they want to be selling at. So here, I, uh, can, I mean, assuming that you're rational, totally rational, that you'll be, you'll be willing to pay at the lowest price, right? So that means in this case, if you're going to buy, you'll be buying at 521. But if you want to sell shares to someone else, and you don't have the patience to do so, to do queuing up over here, and if you want to sell it straight away, then you would go to the buyer side. In this case, you're going to go to the buyer side to say, who is buying? I can see someone's buying 41 thousand shares at 520, and then 33 thousand shares at 519. And again, being rational, Daniel, how much would you want to sell it for? How much I would want to sell it for the best uh, buy price, which is, sorry, I've got to look in. So $5.20 is what I would want to sell it for. Well, being rational, you probably want to sell, sell for a little higher than that, right? But in this case, given the amount of buyers <laughs> orders that is available over there, the, the, the maximum amount of price, the, max, the highest price you can sell for would be 520. So in this case, as long as you're selling less than 41,459 shares, you'll be selling at 520. Does that mean there is no right answer to your question? That was what, what, irrational. That was just for fun. <laughs> that was just for fun. Right. Sell out at a million dollars. That's not rational enough. It's a billion dollars. <laughs> exactly. Oh, well, I mean, that concludes our tutorial talk. And um, we'll be seeing you in the next video talking about the week two lecture. And, um, Financial analysis. Yes, very important.